the opportunity to speak to you um, around the topic of growth challenges for businesses and particular family businesses. When Imran um, spoke to me around it, we thought um, we're going to widen it. So not only making it pure sort of applicable for family business, but I will touch on those organizations in particular a little bit later. Um, what I'd like to share with you really is some of the research that we've done, and I call this weathering the storms, to allow firms to weather the storms. Um, because as we know, especially in, entrepre in, in entrepreneurial settings, um, the climate can sometimes be quite rough and wind blows from many directions. As entrepreneurs, we need to handle this. And um, to start with really, what we've seen is, um, if we go back, and um, this is data from the UK, we've seen a real revival of small businesses. And with small businesses, we mean in the UK, businesses who have up to 250 employees. And what has been fascinating really, until the 1960s in the UK, it was really assumed a bit like what Karl Marx has said, that we end up with large organizations predominantly because of economies of scales. So we'll have a few monopolies and sectors and they would really dictate the terms for everybody else. What we've seen since the 1960s, actually this has changed quite a bit and we've seen an increase in the number of self-employed and also the number of organizations. So how many businesses do we have in the UK? And why I'm sharing this with you is, is because it also provides some of the background that we've done in terms of the research. Um, in line with this, so what we've seen is in the UK, we've got um, around 5.2 million businesses. Um, what is really interesting, they started the collecting of data um, in 2000s, actually, that despite the sort of recessions we faced in 2008, and earlier on, the number of firms have increased um, consistently over the years, um, which is a sort of a, a fascinating trend. And this is across all industry sectors. Some of you will um, be aware, um, because I understand from the audience, um, it's a very diverse uh, group of people in here. In the UK, we've seen the biggest growth um, in service-oriented companies over the last few years. Um, what is interesting, though, is, you know, so we've seen a number of firms increase, as I showed before, but we actually have some new, no, new firms entering, but a lot of firms are exiting at the same time. And what I mean with exiting firms, we talk about entering of firms, which is when they are registered, and exiting when they cease to exist. And when they cease to exist, we call this they, their survival rate has diminished. And what we see, and this is not only for the UK, um, but this is across the world, survival of new ventures is very low. Within five years, on average, 50% of firms cease to exist. And I think that comes back to, you know, weathering the storms and also, you know, challenges for family businesses, as we said before, actually, even over the first five years, getting off the hold is quite a tough undergoing. So, what else do we see in the market um, in terms of that creates that we have a storm that is sort of brawling? And um, what we look at in, in, in the academic sort of research world, in order to measure entry and exit of firms, we look at what we call VAT registration and deregistrations. In the UK, the level for when you need to be registered for value added tax, so VAT, is £70,000. And you might actually say, gosh, that is not the best measure. And I fully agree with that, but it's the best possible data that we can get. When I mentioned before, we have 5.2 million businesses in the UK. Out of those, just above 2 million businesses actually are value added tax registered, which is actually shows that a lot of the firms that we have in the UK actually are very small. But what is interesting when we look at value um, added tax of registration and deregistration, we can really measure what we call the level of turbulence. And with level of turbulence, I would say it's a little bit like um, when you wash your hands. And if you put, you know, you have a little tub in the, in, in, you, you pull the water, it's the entry of firms, and then you have water pulling out at the bottom. And what you see when you look at the water, you create a level of turbulence which is a whirlwind and which makes it quite tough for the water to handle. And this is what it's like really with firms entering. So we've got an entry or registration of firms, which is the inflow, and we've got the deregistration, which is the outflow. 
And what we've really seen over the years is that the number of inflow has increased, but also the number of outflow, creating a lot of turbulence in the market. This varies by industry. So um, agriculture in the UK has seen quite a low level of turbulence because there are fewer firms entering and few firms exiting, whereas the service sector, we have seen a very high degree of inflow, but also outflow. An example I always give is when you look at restaurants in cities, I think when we have our favorite restaurant and you come back after a certain period of time, often those places no longer exist. Um, what, so what you can see on this table, you can see registrations, deregistrations, and then stock at the year end. And what we mean with stock is the number of firms that are registered. So you could see the latest data that's available for the UK is 2008. And you can actually see this is around 2 million businesses. So what does it mean? So what we can actually see in the economy looking at the data is we've got a remarkable level of turbulence and that more than 25% of all jobs in the private sector are usually destroyed over a 12 month period. And that um, these metrics have been pretty stable over time and what we call them job creation and job destruction. So what we need to take away is yes, we've got more firms coming in, we also all know that you know, firms are very important for the economy in terms of wealth contribution, in terms of employment that they're creating. But actually as firms, we're in a quite tough market because the turbulence within it is actually pretty strong. On top of that, um, which is fascinating, and I'd be really interested to getting your thoughts at the end um, of, of the session is what we find in Europe, and this is not only in the UK, but in Europe as well, is that very few firms make it very large. So we talked about 5.2 million businesses in the UK. So what you can see is when you look at the right-hand side of the graph, which shows large companies, so firms which have more than 250 employees, um, they only are 0.1% of those 5.2 million businesses, which is a very small fraction. Medium-sized companies, up to 50 employees, have 0.6, and the predominant force of 99.3%, which is the dark column on the left-hand side, and the small is the number of firms in it. So what we can see is not only do we find more turbulence for sectors, but we also find that very few firms actually make it quite big. And in some ways, what we've seen in the UK as the government, we've realized actually in terms of turnover, those large firms, of course, contribute quite a lot to GDP, which is 53.2%, and they produce 40% of employment. It doesn't mean the SMEs are not important. I think it shows when we look in total, they provide 50% of employment and nearly 50% of GDP. So they're a real force that shouldn't be underestimated. However, is, you know, what can we do to make those firms bigger? So, to summarize, what we see so far is 50% of businesses fail before their fifth birthday. Actually, what we've also done on top, we've done there's some more research that says when you are in those dynamic markets, this 50% drops to the third birthday. So in dynamic markets, as I outlined to you before, where we looked at the inflow and, and outflow, which is quite high and the turbulence is high, business survival becomes even shorter because we're dealing with far more new pressures that the companies have to face. So what we can see is entry of firms is relatively easy, easy but survival is not. And on top of it, of those people, of those firms that survive, very few make it to become large organization, as I showed you before, which was 0.1% of companies. So the question is that we need to look at actually, what can we learn from this and why is this survival so low? So why do so many ventures fail? And this is whether we're talking about family businesses or whether we talk about SMEs. Um, why is that the case? And there's been no surprise in quite a lot of research along the lines on it. The first um, point that's often brought up is that technology simply does not work. And technology also becomes dated. And there are two things, I think, when we look at it, early stage companies, 
I always say is, you know, sometimes entrepreneurs become too focused on the technology and they're producing technology where there's actually no need or demand in the market. All the technology actually is already dated. So by the time the company gets momentum, you know, it is nearly out of date. Second point is actually that there's no market gap. And people often say, gosh, that is pretty straightforward. You know, we should all notice, you know, if there is no market gap. But it again it comes back to markets are moving very quickly. We are now in a global environment where we see if we think of a, a solution, the chances that someone else has thought of this problem and a similar solution or even better solution um, is pretty, um, um, the chances are very high. So that there's no market gap. So there's no need that we can fulfill with our entrepreneurial business. Third point is lack of finance. Um, I always think lack of finance can sometimes be seen also as an excuse, as we all know cash is king. And I know there are different, slightly different financial rules and in, 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 in your case, it's not quite comparable to the UK or Germany. But I often companies, or when we speak with entrepreneurs and family businesses, actually they say it's a lack of finance that's causing them problem. Interestingly enough, family businesses tend to outperform um, firms on this regard because they keep a big box of cash um, as a reserve. So they are more, I think, especially through the recession, have proven to be much stronger because they had a bigger cash cabinet to help them survive. The fourth point is why do so many ventures fail is tough competition. And I alluded to that. I mean, when we talk and, you know, you've had a series on blue ocean and red ocean, if you had a lot of competition in your in your case, it is actually seen as, you know, it's very hard to differentiate. Um, you need to compete. And if you are a younger firm in the game, you know, as soon as you get into the price competition spiral, being in a tough competitive market can be quite lethal for a company. Fifth point, and I think I'm, the, the next three points really link quite closely together is what we see a lot is, as sort of I was kindly introduced before, is as part of my role, I look after a program called the BGP or Business Growth and Development Program, which is for owner managers with businesses of say half a million turnover to 30 million turnover. And what we've done is in terms of research, we looked at what are their main challenges and why do they sometimes quite come quite close to, you know, I don't know, ceasing to exist and to survival. And a lot of this is linked to those three points, which I'm going to explain now in together is first is lack of management skills. Um, what we find is actually just because someone started the business, it does not necessarily mean when they grow the business, they are the best person to continue running it. Um, and they need to also scale up. I mean, we always say the best investment you can make as an entrepreneur is also to invest not only into your staff, but into yourself. The second is ineffective team. When you start a business, it is your baby. And you know you want to manage it and you want to control it. And what we see with a lot of entrepreneurs, they, you know, initially they are what we call artisans. So they, they know everything about the product, they know the market, and they 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 work around it. As the company grows, they become heroes. And what I mean with heroes is they do everything. If there's a problem in finance, in sales and marketing in research, in speaking with customers, they are the ones who are the hero who manage it. However, as the company grows, that's not sustainable because unfortunately the week only has seven days and 24 hours and they need to hire staff. And they become, they bring in good people. And I think, but what, the, because it's their baby, what happens is they often is what I call, they become meddlers. And what I mean with meddler is they are, they, they, their staff come up with good solution and they walk in and they say, why don't you do it this way? Why don't you do it the other way? And so what you're creating is they haven't got the best effective team. And this is often a reason why companies become a struggle, especially if it's linked to a tough competition, to other factors where the team actually cannot compensate and bring it forward. Um, what they really need to become as an owner is you need to become a strategist and not work in the business, um, but on the business. The next point, which is the seventh point on the slide is lack of leadership. And um, 
what is important to see is there's a difference between management and leadership. And we see as with lack of leadership, we mean what is the vision for the business and where do you want to move forward? So it's not only about managing, and but it's about leading. And again, not only necessarily the founder or the entrepreneur is the best person to be the manager or the leader. And it's very important to realize when is it a good time to step back and let someone else maybe who is better in this part of the job take over for it. The last point is actually industry grows too slow. And what we've actually seen is, especially in the recent years in, in Europe with the recession kicking in is, that some industries have just really slowed down, which has made it very hard for companies to achieve the growth potential and, and really sustain themselves. So these are some of the common trends that we've seen as why do quite a few ventures fail. So we've seen, yes, entrepreneurship is very important. They're in very turbulent markets, and these are some of the factors. We've taken this a bit further in the center, and we did some research, and because, I mean, Imran said to me, this is especially around um, blue ocean um, strategy is, which of course says you should go into a blue ocean and not in a red ocean, which is a very competitive space. And linked with business survival, what we said actually, my colleague Professor Andrew Burke and I, we actually looked at and said, how does market competition affect business survival, especially in the early years? And what can we learn from this for more established companies. And what we did is we explored 2 million businesses in the UK and we looked at entry and exit um, of those firms over a 10 year, 10 year time period. Um, this piece was published in the Harvard Business Review um, one and a half years ago. What we found, what is quite interesting, what you can see is we were interested particularly in the survival um, of the first three years. And what we could see is, so you can see in the table, you say T equals one, so is in year one, T equals two, year two, and, and T equals three um, in the third year. And what you can find on the left column is business context. So we actually said, we mean at capacity, which means actually there, the exact is the, 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 the industry is in equilibrium. So there's enough firms, so the supply and demand is matched. Or we have what we call a tough market where we have more supply than there's demand. So there is more competition there. Or we called it what we identified as an easy market. So there is less competition than there is demand. So it's an easy market to get in. So what we did is we looked at the UK, we looked at different industry sectors, and we assessed what is the impact of business survival over those three years. And what is really interesting to see is if you look in year one, you know, if you are in, a, in, a, in, a, in, an, in an easy market, so in a market which has very little competition, your survival rate is the highest. So you could see, you know, easy market or at capacity, which is the third row, it's 91.3%, which kind of is very much in line with blue ocean strategy. If we, however, move forward to T equals three, what we can actually see this changes slightly. Because what we did is actually say you start at capacity in a tough market and an easy market, but then you move, you know, the markets change because we've got turbulence. So if you move, for example, from a, from a tough market into an easy market, we actually see survival rate is 75.3%. If you were in an easy market in the year in year one and you move into a tough market, you actually end up with a survival rate of 58.3%. So what does that actually mean? As that's in, in a little bit you might say counterintuitive, and I don't mean to overthrow the whole blue ocean um, um, literature on this, but I think what we found is so when you start in a tough market and you move into an easier market, it's a bit like you get an immunization. And what, was, what I mean with that is as children, we all get immunization for various children diseases. And of course, we don't want to get an overdose because that's very lethal. But what it prevents us is immunization. It makes us stronger in the longer term when we are adults, when we get the disease that we can bounce back from it. 
And that's a little bit what we observed when we did this piece of research. So when you start in a tough market, you somehow get immunized. And when you move into an easier market, you are much stronger. Whereas when you start in an easy market and then you face the tough consequences, your survival chances are much lower. So what can we learn from this? Because I know in the room, it's not only about startups, it's about bigger organizations like yourselves that you are in. And we found a few managerial implications. I'm just going to point one or two out. I think is what we said is in terms of learning is um, from a startup point of view, never overfund a venture, uh, which is the first lesson. And what we mean with that is as soon as early stage businesses or initiatives, because you could also translate this if and within your organization, you want to launch a new subsidiary, if you overfund it, people can spend money and they're not as resourceful as they could be. Um, so never overfund a venture. Second point is mimicking competitive pressures. And what we mean with that is Virgin is a great example. What Virgin does is actually within the organization, they create competitive environments. So they have different units competing against each other. So they're not only facing the external market, which might not be as competitive, but they're creating an artificial competitive pressure inside. So people need to compete for resources, whether it's staff, whether it's financial resources, HR, marketing, etc. And that makes you more competitive in the long run. Another example, maybe to realize, which is quite extreme, is what we call born again competitors. And the Sealed Air Corporation is a US company, which is a wonderful example for this. Sealed Air Corporation was um, in the 80s actually had a big um, war chest of money. And they were really holding a monopoly in their sector but they realized that their technology was slowly coming to an end. And the board got quite nervous because they, they were feeling like, how are we gonna compete in the longer term when that technology is no longer going to be um, market leading? And what they did, um, they actually paid out huge dividends, which basically deplenished their financial resources that forced them actually to become very critical of how they're going to spend money, how they're going to move forward, where they're putting an investment in terms of R&D in it to really make them competitive again for the long term. Um, and the last example I'm going to refer to here, which I call born to run and um, Southwest Airlines or for those of you maybe you've traveled in Europe, Ryanair, I think are wonderful examples. Southwest Airlines didn't really start it in a highly competitive market space. I and mean, the airline industry, when Southwest Airlines was launched, was highly regulated. And you know, to move into this space, they were not moving into a blue ocean. They were really moving into a red ocean. But what they did is from day one, in some ways, they, they had to fight this tough environment. And they really created what I call a DNA, which helped them to be competitive in the long term. So what I'd like to say, I don't want to overturn everything that you know about, you know, you should avoid competition, but I, what I'd like to say really is within your organization, if you can create a DNA that will help you immunize yourself against competition, I think it's very useful. So a bit of competition, I think is very good because it makes you more alert, it makes you more resourceful and more careful in terms of how you're spending your resources strategically. So, so we looked at so far is business survival. We said it's pretty low. Many firms you know, don't make it to the fifth birthday and they don't become very big. We looked at some of the factors that really you know, inhibit um, growth or cause a, um, business survival to be not as high. And the next thing I wanted to talk to is more around the entrepreneur. And I'm aware there are only a few entrepreneurs in the, in the room but I wanted to share with you something that we've been working on over the last two years. And that is resilience. Because what we've seen so far is when we look at small businesses or fast growing companies and family businesses, we face a lot of adversity all the time. It's a very turbulent environment to be in. And what we really need to is we need to bounce back from all these challenges. And this is what really resilience is referred to. 
uh, resilience is a concept that originally comes from psychology and means the, the capacity to bounce back in the face of significant stress or adversity. And what is really interesting is when we, you go to, um, in, in Europe or you read the press, the word resilience is used a lot. Um, but it's actually not as clearly defined. So when we look back in originally, I said it emerged through um, psychology and it very much looked at young people living in high risk situations. And it was assumed resilience to be a trait. So something that the individual possess, but not something that actually can be taught. More recently, actually, we found out that resilience is something actually that can be trained and actually that is heavily influenced by the environment you're in. And in psychology, they said actually there are four areas how resilience can be divided, which are um, situational patterns. So, you know, what, who is the network you're in? What is your approach to life? What relationship do you have? And what's your disposition? But nothing has really been done in the area of entrepreneurship. So actually we've used the term, but actually what does resilience mean? for entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurial businesses. So we did this and we came up with what we call the 18 attributes of entrepreneurial resilience. And what I really, I only gonna, I'm not gonna bore you and go through all of them, but I just gonna highlight one or two because as businesses, we face a lot of turbulence and a lot of challenges. And so what are some of the aspects that we found are very important? What you can see on the right hand side, you see the red crosses and some green tick boxes. And what we mean by that is the green tick boxes mean they are what I call core constructs. And then the red tick, the red cross means they are key, but they're more like what we call hygiene factors. So they're expected that you have them if you know, in terms of being resilient. So the first point we mentioned is experience and expertise. As a business owner or entrepreneur, it's, it's, it's expected that you have experience or expertise in your sector, that you understand your market, that you understand your product, or at least have a team around you that can support you. So it's a given, it's a hygiene factor. The same is, you know, that, you know, integrity is actually seen, this is based on data from Germany and the UK, is actually seen as a hygiene factor. So people assume that this is, is, is taken. And also the last point, which is E15, you can see to pick, pick up a third, is that people are motivated. You know, as an entrepreneur, business owner, whether it's family business, that you're motivated to want to bring this business to the next level is taken for granted. What I wanted to share with you, though, is, you know, what makes people more resilient is, is the, the ones with the green cross. And I think some of these are, for us, were quite not surprising and some ways were more surprising when we saw them. One is building and leveraging a team, which is E2, which was seen as very important and as a key construct. So having a strong team and being able to leverage this when you face diversity is absolutely crucial. So empowering a team that can help you overcome situation is seen as key. Third point really is, is E3 is having what building and leveraging a social capital. And I'm aware in, in, in different culture, it varies in yours, you know, the, the network is, is really important, but I think this came out as a very vital factor. So when you deal with adversity, with challenges, with turbulence in the business, in order to bounce back is you not need to have a great team, but you really need to be able to leverage and build your social capital. So your networks, your connections across the industry, um, across, the important um, stakeholders within your organization. Um, two points I think is, is important actually, which surprised us a little bit, are the next two, is taking advice from external parties. So those entrepreneurs came out to be especially um, resilient that were able to listen and take advice from others. So actually they, were, they had external advisors, they took their advice, you know, digested it and made a decision necessarily not always taking it for granted, but at least considering it, being open-minded about it. And also they're very good in communicating with the stakeholders. So when problem came up, they were easily communicating them, 
will be able to bring people in and sort of leveraging and the, the team, the stakeholders to, to overcome any challenge that they were facing. I'm going to only mention two more points really and then I'm going to move forward is um, which is E9 which was also a bit we, we thought was fascinating to come up as entrepreneur changing role within the business and what we mean was that is actually those who are very resilient as organizations as individuals were the ones who could identify whether when it's the right time for them maybe to step aside for certain aspects within the business and get better people in who can do this. And I think the last point I'm going to mention is the, the bottom one, which is E18, which we call work-life balance. And that might be surprising. And we said with work-life balance, we followed this up. This is a quantitative study, but also with some qualitative research. And we explored it. And what that means is not that you only work an hour a day, but those people who are very resilient were the ones also had a bit of work-life balance and they were conscious of looking after themselves and that means health-wise um, in terms of um, the nutrition, the sports, the environment they're living in. So work-life balance is a very important point for any leader and I think that's where this is transferable also to not only SMEs or family business or larger organization is a very important point in terms of what makes people resilient, hence bouncing back from adversity. Okay, now before, for, before I close the session, because I'm conscious that I've been given 40 minutes, um, I wanted to talk particularly about something that we've done in family business, um, as this topic is also was mentioned around family business. Just because there are a lot of definition of what makes a family business. In the UK, family businesses are defined as where the majority of votes are held by the person who established or acquired the firm or one of their heirs, or, um, and at least one representative of the family is involved in the management of the firm. If it's a listed company, they need to possess at least 25% of the right to vote through their share capital. So this is how we define family business. Family businesses, as we all know, are hugely important. Um, in the UK, two thirds of um, privately owned companies are family businesses. So if you look at family business in the private sector, unfortunately, I couldn't get data for Pakistan. Um, but what we can see is um, the percentage of family business in the private sector across countries is really high. In the UK, it's 70%. You can see on the left, the highest being in Venezuela and Germany, which is um, 95 or 91%. So family businesses um, are hugely important. Um, how many people do they employ? So it's not only in terms of contribution to GDP or the number, it's how many people do they employ. Again, across the board, you could see the minimum really is 50% around the world. Um, contribution to GDP, huge. Um, in some countries, more than others. Um, interestingly, Italy really stands out as 94% of GDP is contributed or is, is contributed by family businesses. Oh, and here we can see Pakistan, it is 80%. I hope this data is correct. I got this from the OECD. So family business, hugely important. What can we learn though? What has research shown us? What makes family businesses really stand out? And this is where I would wanted to share with you something what I call what we refer to as hidden champions. Hidden champions is a terminology which is gaining more and more momentum in, in I think in the literature and in general. So what we mean with hidden champions, hidden champions are firms that fulfill three or have three criteria. They belong to the top three in, a, in the global market or they're number one on their respective continent. They have less than five billion revenue and they're not very known. So they're unknown, they're very big in revenue, and actually when it comes to their niche market, in their, they are number top three in the global market and number one in their continent. What is really interesting, most of those hidden champions are family businesses. And what we can see is, and this is maybe where my German heritage now feels in, Germany is particularly, has a particularly high number of those hidden champions. 
uh, with 1,307 hidden champions, followed by the US, which is much lower with 366, Japan, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, France, China. Um, what is really important, you might actually say, what makes those hidden champions stand out? And I think what is, I think this is where a lot of lessons can be learned for family businesses, is the first thing, they set themselves very ambitious targets. I mean, hidden champions um, achieved over the last few years across markets, growth rates of 10%. And so their global market share is 30% um, globally, and it's growing. So this is number one, extremely ambitious targets. Second is they have a strong focus and they have depths. So they are really niche players. Um, and this is what makes them really stand out. And they work very deep into their value chain. So those family businesses are very niche focused and they cover most of the value chain. Um, for example, Ullmann, which is a German company within the pharmaceutical packaging service, they cover their whole value chain and they say their motto is, you know, um, we will do only one thing, but we do it better than anyone else. Um, another example is a German company called Wetzel, which some of you might have used and um, without knowing, they are the world leaders in producing trolleys for airports and supermarkets. So when you transport your luggage, this is a German company and they're classified as a hidden champion. So this is um, number two. Number four, um, they are very innovation driven firms and those family businesses really stand out in terms of innovation. And they actually spend more on R&D, five times more than large corporations in proportion of their revenue. So they're very R&D driven. The fifth point they're doing is closeness to customers. They are really work closely with their customers and that's giving them a competitive edge. I, I spoke to one of the hidden champions in the UK and they said actually what they do with all their salespeople is they say, they call them and they make their salespeople call the key customers and always ask the question, what keeps you awake at night? And I think that's a really powerful way of really understanding is what is the problems that you help? How can we help you solve it? So that's number five. Um, what they're also very strong is, um, so they are global companies. So they're small, their focus is very small, but they, they are global, that makes them large. So their strategy in terms of moving forward is not only to be as diversified as possible, but to be diversified geographically with a very narrow product portfolio. And I think the last point is um, what I think comes back to what I mentioned before, what comes to business survival, and hopefully that will tie it all a bit together, is they are, have very loyal and high qualified employees. So the turnover of staff is very low in those hidden champions. And, you know, they are, have a very high performance culture. So in terms of the remuneration system, most of them are very highly remunerated for hitting targets and being ambitious. And they have very strong leadership. And what is interesting with them is actually their CEOs, when on average, when you look at FTSE 100 or DAX equivalent companies, CEOs have a lifetime of three to five years. In those um, companies, hidden champions, which are family owned, you actually find that the average tenure of a CEO is 20 years plus, which really makes it stand out. And I think make sure that families can also put the impact on it. It has a very strong culture, which really makes people loyal to stay, but also provides this ongoing strong leadership. So my last 10 lessons, and then I'm gonna hand back to Imran is, to bring all of this together, and I know I covered various aspects of what business is about, is I think I have 10 lessons that we've come up with, which makes you stay in the fast lane, whether this is a family business or whether that's an entrepreneurial fast growing uh, venture. I think it's really important to keep the passion alive in the business. You know, I mean, so everybody in the business, you know, you do what you love and love what you do. And I think it's easier said than done to implement. For an entrepreneur or founder, it's very important to become a strategist. And what I mean with that is not working in the business, but working on the business. 
So what is the vision? What is the long-term goal that you want to set? We all talk about it, but I think it's important and that's another aspect to look at. It's very important to have a business plan around it. Um, a lot of family businesses that we meet um, who are might not quite yet be a hidden champion is they don't do this long, they do long-term planning because that's what family business will take them apart, but they haven't got a written document that you can easily share with your key staff. So everybody gets involved and everybody gets engaged with it. The fourth lesson is what I call sticking to the knitting. And it's maybe a very British expression, which I've learned, but I think is learning lessons from the hidden champions is Often companies go too quickly, diversify too quickly. And what we've seen in lessons we learned from the hidden champions is a niche to win. And I think we can actually, it's easier sometimes to launch a new product or move into a new market with your existing product and, and, and really sell more of what you already have to your customers. Um, five lessons for me is know your competition and be a step ahead. As we've seen before, Markets are very turbulent. We've got more competition coming in. As I said, a bit of competition, I think, creates the right DNA, but it's important to keep on track on what the competition is doing. And when we get all busy in the business, and I have to say, I come from a family business, and when I speak to my uncle, I just sometimes think, uncle, you know, what have we also, you know, what, what our competitors are doing? We sometimes all get so focused on the day-to-day -day that we don't look outside. So it's really, you know, knowing what the competition doing and staying um, ahead of the game. Numbers are really important. And those um, hidden champions, the successful firms, they really know their numbers. And I grew up in a way um, with my grandfather. I remember he always said every Friday he wanted one note on his desk, which actually said, how much cash do we have in the account? And that's a very visual memory I have. And I always try and tell everybody, that is so important to know your numbers. Um, as companies grow, it's, my point number seven is what we need is organizations change. And when we come to growth, and I think that is a, in a lecture on its own, but we've seen is companies also need to mature. And so you need to bring your team together. As a, as a founder, you might need to adjust your leadership style. It's different from having 50 to a couple of hundred staff and, and I think as a company we need to mature as a result. Develop a team and invest in them but I think it's also really important to invest in the founder and I always say the best money you can spend as a, as a founder or family business is to educate your team and yourself. I mean the ideal situation I would say you want to make yourself redundant and actually hire people who are much smarter than you even though that can be really daunting. Um, number nine, um, and we're nearly there, is what I could learn how to balance um, um, work and, and life. So work uh, smarter, not longer. And that comes back to what I mean with resilience. We've really seen those, those individuals who, who have this balance of work life and look after themselves. And it doesn't mean you're not serious or you're not working hard, but I think looking after yourself they are more resilient and they really stay more in the fast lane. And I think the last one is, I mean, I think in some ways it's a given, but I think it's really important it's to love your customers. And what I mentioned before was one of the lessons from the hidden champion. It's very much, they know their customers. They know what their pain points are. And if you want to stay in the fast lane, you need to love them because the best thing they can do is to, to be, to refer you. It's the easiest way of getting more customers to come in. So this is really what I wanted to cover. Um, I always say with businesses, don't assume everything will go to plan. You might have seen this picture. I, I found it, um, it sort of made the circle on LinkedIn and various pages, but I think reality is down there. And I think that's what we all face and we have to be resilient. And the current climate is quite turbulent. But I think if you have a plan, um, and you have a good team around you and you are resilient, I think we can overcome quite a lot of the challenges. On that note, um, thank you very much and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie, I'm so pleased. Uh, in fact, it seems that you have uh, put in so, so very important points in just 40 minutes. 
Um, great of you. It's one of the skills that we praise you for. Thank you very much. Um, audience, now we are open for questions and answers. <laughs> I hope I haven't shocked everybody. <laughs> yes, I can. Thank you very much for giving us very detailed survey of the success and major factors of the entrepreneurship and the new business. Sorry, I, I'm, I, I'm hearing a double sound. Is it better now? Now I can hear you, Imran. Can I speak now? Are you hearing me? Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving us a very good talk on the success and the failure factors of the entrepreneurship as well as the family business in UK and Europe. The problem over here, can I say, is different. It's different. The problem over here, like say Pakistan and India as a whole, First of all, I'm into pharmaceuticals since last 40 years. I'm a director and looking after the international projects. Okay. And I'm working for the fastest growing pharmaceutical company in Pakistan. Oh, how exciting. Uh, having 40% growth over the last seven years. So in two and a half wow. years, we create another company. And if you see the holding of the company, I can say this is purely a family business. Now the question is, we are into environment where the tax rate is 35%. Okay. Indirect tax is 17%. And in Pakistan, if you totally divide on a stock exchange right now, 678 companies are enrolled. Okay. And the concentrated company where more than 85% of the shares are in the hand of one or two or the family is 85%. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Now, Yes, but uh, this is really a wow factor because they doesn't come under the organized sector. Organized sector mean avoidance and evasion of tax. Okay. So the 15% companies who are fighting against them, you can see this is a nightmare for them because uh, they have all the advantages available uh -huh. and you will be surprised they are not paying good salaries to their employees no retirement benefits to their employees. And if I can say that 37% of these companies do not even issue an appointment letters to their employees. And this comes on textile sector. Wow. Seeing all these things over here, any private entrepreneurs having a funds with them, he can be a chances of successful will be very high. Because this 35 and 17% tax and indirect tax is so high that uh, they can compete with anybody you would like to have it. But they only confined it into region. They can never grow now if you have to export. And if okay. you have to come with the global market, then definitely you have to meet all the compliances. Okay. My question over here is to Stephen, there is a need now for all those institutes who works out with the Blue Eastern strategy that uh -huh. Tarun Khanna has come up with a meaning in an emerging market. Huh. We need to have a more knowledge of corporate governance, yes. corporate ethics. Huh. And the other important thing I will request you to please carry out this survey in Pakistan or India. And I think IBA can work very well with you that uh, your entire lecture will change. If I say, if you take it, the success and failure factor only two criteria I frankly say this lecture will not be applicable in Pakistan except the generic one. Except the generic one. They will never employ any leader 
from outside the family. Listen one more thing. So, so you know it's really interesting because that used to be the same in, in Europe and this has now changed. But uh, we are just waiting for that big C when huh. this change will come to Pakistan. Huh. That'd be I'm fascinating. Sorry, I have not asked you this question. But, uh, I am not uh, asking you any question, but I have listened to your entire lecture. And I was just listening that if we would have provided the same environment, we would have the better chance of success. But yeah. unfortunately, over here, the environment is not as safe. Will be really interesting, maybe whether it's possible to do some research more, where you can compare. One more and statistic. Hmm? One more statistics, which is very sound. Pakistan is having a population of 190 million. I know. And every day we are growing with Afghanistan people coming in. There is a one more very tragic statistics. Only one person of the population paid a direct tax. And if you just see if any person who is paying more than 1,000 pounds is selling tax, including the corporates in Pakistan, they are less than 10,000. So now compare all these books under it's this. Hard. Mm. It's really very hard. No, it's very, just... very hard. Ask employees, people who are working over here, they have a different class of life because their tax is deducted, withholding tax and everything. And in the National Exchequer, they contribute 53% of the tax and the industry and the services sector are not paying any taxes at all. Yeah, it's... So, um, so which is the success factor? They are having good house, good cars, yeah. lot of travelings, no yes. problem and employees work late, get a heart attack, attack as well as always the pressure to meet the targets for these entrepreneurs. It's a, you know, it's fascinating because I'm from Germany originally. In Germany, we're the most, I think, one of the most efficient tax countries in the world. <laughs> but I just advocate Ulman is a, one of the best company. We yes. have their 15 machines, mm -hmm. blister machine. And there is one other company in UK, DHI industry. Yes. Which make the inhalers. Yes. Very I've successful come. company. There are three entrepreneurs who are the partners having 33% shares each. Oh, wow. No, Ulman, I'm aware of. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. So, uh, do we have any other questions, please? Yes, sir. Uh, it's better to come to the laptop because we were not able to look at the multimedia system that IBA has. Unfortunately, that won't work. Otherwise, we could have addressed the question right from the seat. If, if you can please come near the laptop, so that I'll just get <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Ali Zaman, uh, nice working here uh, in Sami. Okay, uh, my question uh, is uh, actually, uh, first of all, I want to uh, just uh, repeat the words uh, which you said uh, earlier, uh, that 70% of the business uh, are family business in UK, uh, out of all private businesses. So am I right? Uh, I heard that uh, when you were saying in the lecture. Yes. Okay, so the, in the family business uh, and all, all of the business uh, hidden champions are all uh, family business. Yes, the majority. They, I would say they, they are one or two exceptions, but the majority are yes. Okay, uh, so the, the my, my question is that actually, the, can you give us some examples related to the hidden champions in pharmaceutical industries? Um, yeah, the only one I'm aware of, and I'm happy to sort of look some of them up, who I know is Ullmann, which produces packaging for the pharmaceutical companies rather than um, the actual drugs. But what I can do, I have a list of hidden champions, and I can share it with Imran, and then he can distribute it to you. So you can get a list of, from last year of a list of all the hidden champions that have been classified. And then you might be able to pick up which ones are pharmaceutical, which ones are not. So I'm only aware of one because I've met them and I've sort of interacted with them, which is Ullmann. But I can provide you a list which you, you can then go through yourself. And with you being from the sector, you might be able to identify which ones they are. Okay, okay. fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Hi. Hello, nice to meet you.
Namaste, Mayor. Uh, Adnan Wahab here. Uh, I just wanted to ask, as you have mentioned in your uh, lecture, that uh, to stay ahead of the competition, you have to invest in research and development. But when we talk about uh, family-owned businesses in Pakistan, yes. I mean, uh, they don't really want to go into that area. So can you name uh, some other key drivers that could help us to stay ahead of the competi competition? I mean, I mean, from what they say with the hidden champion, I mean, um, I mean, R&D is not only R&D in terms of if you think developing new products. So R&D yeah. could be, you know, in terms of developing the business, mainly is, of course, the product. The other thing is what they find with those companies, they are very um, niche focused. So those right. hidden champions are very niche focused. So and they create the whole value chains. So they produce. So if you have packaging, they produce a packaging, you know, they even grow the material. So they, they extend the value chain. So they have complete control over them. So they can then also get the best margins and the highest quality. So what you find with most hidden champion is they're very niche, um, but they have a very long value chain. And I think another point is, is the R&D you mentioned is, I think the, the leadership and I think the loyalty of their staff, because I think they're family businesses. You have the patriarch, you know, yeah. the, or the, the founder who is really setting long-term goals. And I think people want to stay. So what you find is there's very little, and um, they invest heavily in their staff. So there's no, um, they don't lose staff. So there's very little turnover of staff. So they get really quality staff because they train them up. And yeah, so they can right. really produce what's very good. I think these are the main points what differentiates them. Okay. Now, uh, talking about the family business again, uh, and referring to your point, uh, targeting the niche market. Once again, I, I somehow I find it that uh, the family uh, owned businesses, uh, uh, the entrepreneurs, they find it, I, I don't know, they find it easy to go into the uh, masses or the markets uh, they try to capture the large markets instead of going in for the niche market. Hmm. That That is another thing that happens over here. Hmm. I mean, Maybe. I heard this in, in Malaysia. I think it's the same. Companies are far more diversified in right. Malaysia, for example, than they're in Europe. I mean, what we've seen is with those hidden champions, because it's not only, as you saw on my list, they're not only measured in the UK or in Germany and Europe. They also are in other parts of the world. And what we find is that, that those firms are, they really drill down their expertise to a certain sector. And then within that, they do the whole value chain. So that might diversify them, but it's all within the remit of what they're producing, the core product. I mean, so you think in, in Pakistan, is it more diversified across family businesses? Do all family business diversify a lot? Um. Sometimes it, it doesn't, doesn't happen all the time. Maybe I mean, I think what we, they found here is it's just if you are more niche focused, you really can gain a lot of expertise and you can get economies of scale. So because yeah. you produce more, so you get incentives by having the controlling the value chain, you can improve the quality. And again, yeah. you can gain margins because you don't lose them from using suppliers from other parts. So yeah, they have gone down vertically through the whole supply chain, but okay. still be quite narrow focused. So to give you this example of Wetzel, which produced trolleys for okay. um, airports and supermarkets. So they ha the trolley is used in different industries, but right. they're only producing really trolleys in different shapes and forms. They haven't gone and now producing um, automotive parts, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, but they own everything from producing the, the metal, the wheels, they, they do the whole thing, and then the assembly. So they're okay. very independent on of suppliers. Okay. They are not depending on others, on no. the suppliers. Yes. Okay, fine. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Stephanie, we'll take two more questions. Of and course. then I'm sorry, I'm, I'll not be able to invite you for the refreshments that we have over here, but I'll make sure that I'll bring over something. <laughs> Um, from here to you. Please. Hello, ma'am. Uh, this is Omer, uh, working as a product manager in the SAMI. I just want to ask a simple question. What is the literacy or education level 
uh, of the man who is running the family business over there. And the reason for my question is, uh, is it uh, if it is very low, then uh, how does it drive vision, or where does the vision comes from? Yeah, I mean, I think what we've seen is there's a bit of a generation difference now. So what we can see is with some, um, I work with some family businesses who are now moving into second or third generation. And, you know, you find the first generation, often they haven't got much schooling background because it was, they set up the business out of necessity. And uh, so they might, but they've sent now their children are getting more educated. And so th the way they have done it, I think it's, it's important to realize, be open to learn. I think what we see is a lot of family businesses who are doing well is, you know, they are realizing even though they have not maybe been to university, you know, they, they haven't got the, I don't know, the high end education that you all have, for example, is that it's important to have it. And I think that differentiates them. So I think, and that gives them the vision forward. And we've seen now a few people come even to Cranfield, entrepreneurs who've never been to university and they do like an executive program and they enjoy because they can interact with like-minded individuals who are on the same level, but who maybe haven't had the opportunity to interact, but they invest in their staff or when they hire people, they realize they want to get the best and education also plays a role in that. Okay, thank you. Does that help? <laughs> what do you find in Pakistan? Is it varies? Uh, yes, it varies a lot and uh, the majority of the uh, uh, family businesses are run uh, by the people uh, in our language we call them said uh, they are not uh, that much well educated but their generations are coming uh, uh, towards the education hmm. yes so that's that's the same here and I think but I think those who are successful are the ones who realize that actually education is important so yes, thank you yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. My is, hello. My name is Rumi, and I'm working for a, a, one of the top uh, four pharmaceutical industry in Pakistan, Sami Pharmaceuticals. Fantastic. I'm working there. I'm working there as a business unit manager. Uh, during your lecture, I had that uh, you mentioned why do so many venture fails, and one of them, the reason you mentioned is technology does not work. Hmm. I had right. Yes. Uh, do you have any examples regarding this that how technology and what is the true meaning by this uh, technology does not work yeah i mean i think i am i'm just thinking whether i can think of something in in pharmaceutical um i mean I, to give you a simple i mean example is um there's a company it was more a technology company but they were doing quite heavy r d and the founders were RNG focused. So they developed the product, which was actually one step ahead even of what the customer wanted. So actually the customer wasn't ready to even buy the product, but they wanted to perfectionize it and make the product as perfect as possible. But the market there was not out it because the market wasn't educated enough. So I guess that is something that then can still wait. But if you only have one or two products that can cause a problem. Technology does not work, etc. Is I mean, the simple is we all, especially in pharmaceutical, you often in, you do heavy investment in R and D, and you know over time you realize maybe sometimes it's two, three years or four, five years down the line. Actually, despite all the right signs, the technology actually is not ready. You know, it's not going to have the impact on humans or on animals that we ho had hoped for. So that's another aspect, and I think the challenge in your sector. If I can only speak from the German pharmaceutical sector, is it's such an expensive to get the products, um, and so and then the timeline is pretty short. So, um, and that's where IP now is becoming more and more important, of course, because you need to protect yourself at least that you get so many years out of it, because you invest R and D, and only I, I mean you will know much better than me the percentage of research that turns into actual products is quite small in comparison to what has been invested. So yes. I think there are two things. Is one is technology simply won't work because the, the research doesn't give a product, you know, makes out of it. Second is the technology is too advanced for what the customer or the, the, 
the, the, the client needs. And I think the third is often that the timeline is too, too long. And over the timeline is companies, yeah, especially if they are relatively young companies, which not a lot of cash behind it, is, there is, you know, it's tough to sustain. And the, yeah, and the peer is often for research becoming longer and longer. So this is what I meant, technology doesn't work. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Okay. Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie. I'm now handing it over to uh, Dr. Ezra Hussain, who will be giving the concluding remarks and will be thanking you. Hello okay. again. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very uh, elaborated presentation, very good presentation. I think it has given a uh, multi-dimensional aspect of family businesses and entrepreneurship and given some uh, uh, terminologies which they did not know, for example, hidden uh, champions. Oh. <laughs> uh, that is then, and they will look for the hidden champions in this uh, country as well, and perhaps would help uh, some uh, entrepreneurs to become hidden champions because yes. they are the people whom the industries can grow. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So thank you very much. And, it's lovely uh, to meet uh, you. It is, uh, and uh, we are moving towards uh, refreshments. And I promise you to bring the refreshment when I came to UK. We are <laughs> I'm looking forward to <laughs> meeting you when you're over here. <laughs> thank you Have very much. Have a good afternoon and evening. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephanie. Bye-bye. I'll catch you later. Please take care. Bye.